we're going to be talking about investment fraud today. Um, so what is investment fraud? This first definition that I have up here is one I got straight from Google, so it's a little bit lengthy, but just a deceptive practice in the stock or commodities markets that entices investors to make purchase or sell decisions on the basis of false information frequently resulting in losses in violation of security laws. So these are a little bit more simple. So basically it's a scheme. They're, they use lies to get you um, false information. They withhold a lot of information and they give you really bad advice. So we're going to kind of talk. Okay, so who is victimized? Does anybody know? So we've got, so victims of investment fraud have which of those characteristics. So what do you guys think? Is it females? Is it people with no college education? Is it people who don't have very much financial literacy in their background? People who live alone or none of them? All four. You guys think all four? All of the above. <laughs> Okay. Ding, ding, ding. It's none of the above. None of the above? Mm -hmm. None of the above. Oh, cool. So, we'll talk about, we'll talk about that a little bit. So here's a uh, video. Lunch at Bill Bowes Barbecue outside of Atlanta. Can you guys hear The me? ribs are hot. <laughs> the table's full. Local stockbroker Steve Sampler is taking a client to lunch, advising on the menu. This part of the country is fairly conservative. And that reflects Steve's own advice to clients. Build wealth safely. Nothing too risky. But Steve does not take his own advice. Steve recently lost $40,000 in an oil and gas scam, purchasing unregistered shares in non-producing oil wells. If it can happen to me, it, it can happen to anyone. He's right about that. Steve is a licensed professional stockbroker, smart, with two degrees, accounting and marketing management. But he was taken in by a con man with a telephone. Of course, they did say that they really hated for me to miss this opportunity, and it was, uh, it was it, I would probably never get this type of opportunity again. The con used an old trick, scarcity, telling Steve there were only a few units left to invest in, and he had to move quickly. He'd make ten times his investment. Steve did not bite at first, but the calls continued, week after week. As I began to talk to him more, and, and of course he knew, he knew basically he was wearing me down. Steve began to know, and like the salesman, a big mistake. Everyone has a tendency to trust you once you get to know them, particularly you, you want to trust them. You don't want to think bad of them. It's not going to happen in the first call. It's going to happen after months and months of doing business with that person, that you're going to be endeared to the personality and share intimate things about your life with them. When somebody starts taking you down that personal lane and asking you about memories and asking you about what makes you tick, they're doing what I'm telling you we did, I did, which was set up my arsenal for the close. The salesman I dealt with, I knew all about his family, his wife, his children, where he lived. Steve sent $20,000 in and received official-looking securities and did some due diligence. I talked to the district manager in Dallas. Oh, yes, there are 15 wells out there. It just, everything was just right in place. So he sent in another $20,000, and it was gone. The shell company liquidated, shut down by the authorities. He's your friend, but then one day, he disappears. Still, how and why does a professional like Steve fall for this? The older I've gotten, the more uh, the more risk I'm willing to take for some reason. Uh, but you know, I, I think what that stems from is I'm not where I thought I should be at this point in life. Oh, I'm trying to get home run. Steve, like so many investors, was trying to play catch up. An all too common tendency among mature investors. He wanted to hit one out of the park. Home runners strike out more often than, than the base hitters. And uh, that's what happened to me. And that's what will happen to anyone else that uh, is not very careful, especially today. You guys surprised by that video? Yes. Um, it, I mean, he's an investment advisor, and he got, what was that, 40000 plus? He said that he knew where the guy lived, he knew his family, so like, it's kind of crazy because they, they get to know you, and so, do you want to say anything else? Yeah. So kind of what we just wanted to um, reiterate there 
is that while that second slide we showed and said, who do you think it is? Is it a college student? Is it females? Is it people that don't know a whole lot about money? Like who is going to be taken advantage of most? More often than not, of investment fraud, it's male college graduates who work in the financial industry. And the reason that that occurs, and Lindsay's going to touch on some of their tactics, is because they start going at you emotionally. So a male investment advisor, when he steps into his suit every day and goes into that office to help advise other people, he's very rational. He knows about the beta ratios and risk assessments and all of that stuff. And he knows, how can I take care of money for my like, um, co-workers or how can I take care of money for my um, customers? But when it comes to them themselves, they sometimes step back and they think, man, I really should have more money saved than I did, which is this guy's problem. He's trying to get retired because it's like he has enough to support his family. And then, um, so investment fraud are financially literate people, and they get taken advantage of because they go at it emotionally. Lottery fraud victims. This is kind of where um, single older consumers and a lot of times females get taken advantage of is with the sweepstakes and the lotteries. Because they like get stuff in the mail, and they're like, oh, I have a chance of winning. And so kind of depending on what fraud you're talking about, it depends who gets taken advantage of most. Um, but just kind of a tenant, the more you find out about financial education, and a lot of times, because people will know, they're really good with their money. Or, he just retired from this really great company, I bet he has money available, that's when they're going to come at you the most. If they just like look at me and they're like, oh, that girl just graduated from college, she has nothing like waste of time, whereas if somebody else is more established, they're going to go to them. Just because there's money available and they think, if I can get them and wear them down, then I'm going to get some money out. How do they do it? Um, I think this is super important because the first thing I highlighted is they're very persuasive. So like I said earlier, they try to get to know you. They want to talk about your family. They want to know how many kids you have and what they're up to. Um, they claim that they're credible. Um, they try to tell you that, oh, my God, we do. We've been doing this for so long. We try to get you to do things that are um, They say that they've never sold an investment that doesn't produce money. Um, they tell you that other people have done it, and so they're trying. So, what was that tactic called, John? Um, social. So, so they use like a social. So they're like, so if I get her to do it, I'm going to tell you that oh, your friend did this, and it could be like a really crappy investment, but you're going to want to do it because she did it. Um, they tell you that they're going to make you deal or a favor, so I'll give you a break on my commission, and then. If you buy today, so they'll give you, they seem like they're making you a deal, and they're really not. Um, and then they give you a false sense of ur urgency. So they say, oh, there's only two units left, or you only have today's the last day for this investment. So should we go back? Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the videos that we want to show you, and as Lindsay like, backs up to it, we're not trying to like push a religion on anyone, but so FINRA provided these videos to us today. We told them we were going to be teaching this class, and they were more than happy to provide their materials um, free of charge to us. But you want to just back up? I think it's the second one this line. But this video that we're going to watch is actually specific to the state of Utah. Um, some of you may have heard that Utah is the fraud capital of the world because, um, quite honestly, people are incredibly trusting here. And a lot of it has to do with the predominant like religious culture and like the conservative nature of people and they just want to like trust people so like Danny's my friend I want to trust him he gets this really awesome like oil deal and he might be like Shauna give me like fifty thousand dollars and we're gonna turn a profit and you'll have five hundred thousand dollars and I'm like okay that's a great idea because I trust Danny if I'm not thinking not to say that Danny's not trust Worthy, but just <laughs> he just told us nobody has a debt. It's over. Um, but just because the nature of people, and they want to trust, and they have that tendency. So we're not trying to push a religion, but they are going to refer a lot to the LBS culture in this film. Utah is a remarkably beautiful place. Snow-capped mountains ring Salt Lake, the state's capital. Those mountains and an active lifestyle are generating rapid growth, while violent crime is rare. Another type of crime, financial fraud seems to flourish. Utah's strong entrepreneurial spirit and dominant religion Mormonism unwittingly aid the growth of fraud and Ponzi schemes. There is an element here uh, within the church theology 
that says that if you pay your tithing and obey the commandments of the church, that the windows of heaven will be opened unto you. And a lot of people, I think, incorrectly interpret that to mean that the windows of heaven will be financial uh, success. This atmosphere has helped criminals like Val Southwick, Bill Hammonds, Jeffrey Moen, and others use their supposed religious faith to con millions of dollars from innocent Utahns, like Jim and Diane Smart. The Smarts are about to lose the home they've owned for 12 years after being defrauded of more than $200,000 to a con masquerading as a church-going financial expert who appealed to the Smarts' deep faith. He was a member of our church, and because he's was seemed like an active, really nice member talking about missionary work. He started saying that it was a, he was helping people because if they invested with him, then they would have money to send their sons on missions, or they could go on missions as couples, and it was helping just people be better church members. It was explained to us that he was active LDS. Ron Bishop lost $180,000 of his retirement savings to a decades-long scam run by Val Southwick that promised 12% annual returns. But the investments were, in fact, bogus and unregistered. All the LDS people that I've ever dealt with have been honest as far as I was concerned. So when I found out this was an LDS company with an LDS president and the fellow that was selling it to me, Aldi was LDS, and they expressed that they were, I felt very comfortable about it. About 60% of Utah residents are Mormon or LDS. They're a close-knit, trustworthy group. Affinity scams targeting religion spread quickly there because of the predominance of the LDS church. Trust among members is the currency. But blind trust can be a big mistake, say experts. If you need to have your appendix taken out, uh, you don't go to a church member to have your appendix taken out. Uh, if you If you need to have uh, a car fixed or uh, repaired. Uh, you don't just go to a person that's a church member. So why is it do that investors go to church members to make investment decisions? The answer, of course, is trust. Experts caution fraudsters readily abuse the trust and loyalty in like groups of people, whether they're under the guise of shared religion, social, or ethnic groups. But it takes more than faith to protect your life savings. If a church member talks to you about an investment opportunity, listen, then call your division of securities, independently verify the offering, and don't allow the trust or the church membership to be uh, a weighted decision maker for you. Any thoughts or experiences that you guys have? after watching the video, affinity fraud is when someone takes advantage of a social or a personal connection that you have. So if I had been teaching like finance classes and you'd come for a few months, if I were to pull off an affinity scheme, I would come up to you guys and be like, you know that I know what I'm talking about because I taught you all about credit, I taught you some stuff about how to pay for college, and I'm teaching you about investing right now. Like this investment that I have, it's guaranteed you're going to get 15%. Yes, no. Slam the door in my face and run the other way. <laughs> your money is your money and don't trust people with it. Um, Lindsay and I always joke at work because some of our family members say that we don't trust people enough. But we're always like, did you hear about that scam? Or did you see what so-and-so did to so-and-so? Oh, it's just horrible. And we're like, that's never going to happen to us. And people accuse us of being kind of ornery or a little bit stingy, which I would rather be accused of being stingy than lose $200,000. Because if anyone has $200,000 to lose, I'd like to be their friend and they can just give it to me. I'm not going to invest all this. Play with it. And so make sure that you guys are careful. But does anyone have any experiences or um, things that they've seen in their own lives or to family members? Yeah. Well, I just think you, you've got to be really smart and be really cautious, kind of what you said. But I just thought this movie was interesting because a couple months ago I was talking to a girl from Kaysville and... She's an LDS, you know, church member, whatever. She said a bunch of people in her board to have that happen to her, and I like looked it up and stuff. And so, I just think that you know, regardless if they're LDS or whatever religion they are or whatever they say they are, you kind of gotta be like really cautious, even if it's like a really good friend or something. Right. Be hyper vigilant. Yeah. And I thank you for sharing that. In my own personal life, I prefer to keep like friends work and like 
my like political and religious views all in separate buckets. Because if somebody, a friend were to come to me and say, hey, I have this great investment opportunity, or I have this insurance product I want to sell you, they're trying to use their friendship to get money off of me, and I don't respect that. But you know what, thanks for the offer, but I'm really good with what I have. Now, if it's like an educational thing, and we're just like sharing ideas, or did you check out that website, or did you hear that new story, then okay. But if you have a friend, and everyone has to make their own decisions, um, but if a church member or somebody's trying to use something like that, I would be very hesitant and just say, you know what, thank you, but we're okay for now. They will try and guilt you. Um, and there's some other tactics that we're going to talk about if you want to just like, skip ahead. And if anyone else has like, stories or anything they can go, feel free to share them. So I should be the best of them. Well, I mean, <laughs> you could like earn like 20%. I love the motion. I heard. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the most important things is to like learn how to like spot the persuasion tactics and like resist it. We have a couple of videos that if you guys are interested, you can take home and they have some super cheesy examples. But in one of the examples, I, we didn't put it in the film tonight, but or the, the presentation, but in one of the examples, this like super shady, like grease back, like big green, like gold chain kind of man calls this guy and is like, hey, hey sir, how are you? And the guy on the phone is like, oh, I'm good. And he's like, oh, that's coincidence. I'm good too. My last name's good. And the guy on the phone is kind of like, okay, like weirdo. <laughs> but then he's like, you know, where do you live? Oh, it's a nice part of town. I have this investment that's going to be really great for like you and your kids. Or oh, you have kids at home. And then the man is like, well, my kids are older. He's like, oh, yeah, that's great. You're, you and your wife probably did a really great job raising them. And so they kind of, he just like starts to like fish for information. And the man is feeling uncomfortable. Like, and he portrays that really well in the film. But then he's kind of like, okay, I guess. Like, I don't want to be mean and hang up. And so he ends up giving the man his address and like a phone number, like a cell phone instead of the home phone, where he can reach him. The fraudster probably is not going to get a whole lot of money the first time. And he knows that. That's not what he cares about. But he just picked up critical pieces of information. He knows there's no kids at home. He knows he lives in a nice part of town. He knows the image and appearance is really particular or important to this man. And so he's going to call back and start to wear him down and wear him down and wear him down. And that's actually what happened to the, invest the investment advisor that got taken advantage of. The um, investor company that was legitimate ended up calling and talking to him three or four times. Um, found out about his wife, his children, what his goals were, and just kept bringing them up. And the man felt special. Like, oh, this guy remembers a lot of details about me. Can we refer back to him? This is on the phone. You don't know what I'm reading. So just be aware of some of those things. Um, these are some other strategies you're going to use. They're super, super persuasive. They're going to try and guilt you into things. Has anyone ever been invited to a free lunch seminar or a free dinner seminar with free books? Yes. And what are they doing there? Mm -hmm. Actually, I got invited to one tomorrow, but it's about real estate. Okay. At Red Lobster. Uh, very nice, but you're going to get a free Red Lobster dinner. I did. All oh, you have to do is get a little bit of money. So what they do, have you guys gone to those? Yep. How did you feel while you were there? Or what was kind of your general like, like sentiments? Or? Well, I've gone to several uh, in the past, so uh -huh. I kind of knew it was going to be some high pressure. Yeah. And, and then there's a whole group of people there that are kind of school of fish all yes. You know, the barracudas are up there feeding and, and they have, everybody's kind of, they're being sold a package. Some cases it's pretty legitimate, in some cases you, you really need to know uh, what they're talking about. If you go in completely uneducated, they can take advantage of you. Very, very quickly. Yeah. I had a friend who went to a free, I think it was a $50 gift card in Vegas and she bought it next Yep. <laughs> she bought it. <laughs> she bought it. Timeshares are notorious for that and then different investment from the scams. And they're just throwing out this information and they have their charts and their graphs. The presentations are phenomenal. Um, I went to one of them because I just kind of wanted to see what it was like. Mm -hmm. And they used like partial truths. Oh, the stock market has averaged this, but our investment's going to gain this. And I'm like, oh, is that real? But how they said it, it made it seem like it could possibly happen. Um, and then when you're in groups, if you go with friends or family members, they might get really excited. And then it's like peer pressure and you're like, darn it, I don't want to be the only honorary one here. That's like absolutely not. We need to take a moment and think about this. So be very, very careful when you get invited to free lunch seminars and things like that. If you decide to take advantage of the dinner, then make sure that you have some backup with you or that you are super strong and just say, you know what, I really enjoyed the dinner. Why don't you give me your phone number? If I'm interested, I'll call you. And then just turn around and walk away and enjoy that with lost dinner. Um, phantom riches is a huge thing. Sometimes I'll take advantage of it. Danny 
I know some details about him, I found out something about his goal, I'm going to promise him kind of like the pie in the sky, this carrot that dangles him, so he'll go with it. Um, scarcity is another big one. Um, if you don't get it today, you're not going to have a chance, or it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The oil wells that we have in Wyoming, we're going to mine them, but with the politics and everything, we might not be able to, we might have to cap it off. If you don't invest in it today, you're not going to win anything. You're not going to earn anything. So we're just going to throw stuff, a, a bunch of stuff to you to get you pressured into it. Um, and then the reciprocity is kind of the dinner theme. They're going to give you a small favor, a $50 gift card. Well, heck, your friend paid for that $50 gift card a million times over with the timeshare. And then getting out of the timeshare is really hard. I think it's been a year because I lose it. Oh. <laughs> she just laughs. <laughs> Say, hey, you don't have timeshare, I'm going to use it. <laughs> but yeah, so just be careful that way. And then source of credibility and the affinity scams um, are huge, especially in Utah. Um, with the warning signs, kind of what we talked about, we make promises or guarantees. They'll tell you that it's a low risk or no risk investment, and if there's nothing that you have learned at all from coming the last couple of weeks, all investments have risks. Even choosing not to invest and keeping your money, just in a savings account, has risks. Inflation might outgrow the money. So when it comes to money, any decision you have has a risk and has a reward, and you just have to decide where you're comfortable. So if they say this investment has no risk, Eh, red flag should be deemed and you should be getting your running shoes on and head the other way. Um, if they tell you that the investment opportunity is confidential or they don't have anything in writing and it's super like top secret and they couldn't register it, that's an also another red flag. And I'm going to walk you through some different sites. There's at least four sites that you guys can go on and check brokers and investment advisors and we'll walk you through those um, this evening and then we have some handouts that go along with that. And one thing that I could throw in at this point is it's all it's your decision. You're making the decision. We know more high pressure. But you make the decision. But so what they're doing is kind of cutting themselves out saying, you're the one that's deciding to do this. Yes. I should have brought my car. And we're deciding we don't I mean we don't want to tell you what to do, but but it's your decision. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so how can we avoid investment fraud? So the first one I have up there is find someone you can trust. So I mean, some people probably, you know, you have friends who are like, hey, this person's good, go and do your research. And there's some cool stuff on your guys' brochures that show some websites, and she'll hit on that too. Um, so it's in the yellow one. If you open it up into the middle, you've got a section that says if the problem occurs or resources. So these are some places that you can check. Um, you can go and see like if the advisor has any complaints and see what people say about him or her. Um, so check them. There's something called an investment prospectus, and that is a fun overview of details. We looked up one and it was like 20 something pages. They're pretty long, but they've got a lot of good information on there. Um, so if the fund doesn't have Anything in writing, it's probably fake, because everything's going to have um, a prospectus on, us, um, on it. Ask a ton of questions. Go in there with like a list, find out the information, take notes, go back, figure it out. Um, take your time, don't feel rushed. So somebody who's going to be fake is going to try to push you into doing things. Somebody who knows what they're doing and isn't lying to you is going to want you to make <coughs> smart choices about it. And one of the challenges so from the investment perspective, you just even a lawyer can't read it. There's so much <laughs> stuff in there <laughs> that doesn't make sense unless you're I deal with big dollars in my career. And I get these perspectives. First of all, many, many pages of small print. Yes. And it doesn't make sense in a lot of cases. And when you go to the advisors, they kind of skim over it too because they don't know what it means either. The, the investment prospectus is not probably the most interesting piece of literature that you're ever going to pick up. Um, I'll just say it straight up. The ones that we get through work for our retirement, because they have so many different funds they're investing in. Um, when I first signed up on the account, my mailbox was inundated with mail. And I, um, the, the postman was like, why don't you check your mailbox more often? Because I get kind of slack with it. And they couldn't shove anything else in there because there were seven different prospectuses that were like that thick. And I was like, ooh, I don't want to read this. I love learning about money, but it, it, I didn't care. 
And so I just threw it to the side. So I made the mistake, and I'm not doing what I'm telling you to do, but make sure before you invest, you have checked the fund overview or the prospectus. The prospectus isn't really any gritty. Fund overview is more of a general um, detail. And I wanted to, I found this as we were heading out the door. Um, this was a must read tip of the day on the saveandinvest.org website. But um, they recommended that if you have a brokerage account, so if you have signed on to the brokerage account because you feel comfortable just buying and selling your own stocks through the help of a broker that's licensed to do that, they recommended that you check your month statement every month. So the brokerage statement is going to be a lot smaller than your prospectus, but it's important to read that because if there's any unauthorized transactions on there, you have 10 days to dispute them. So if you notice there's a sale on there that you did not authorize and then your broker did not contact you about, you can go in and file a complaint um, with the Investor Complaint Program, which is in this brochure, and then with um, Fighting Fraud and FINRA, and I'm going to show you those websites coming up here. But just make sure that you're on top of that. And they did say in the time of the markets when they're crashing, they're probably not exciting to read. It's probably a little bit depressing, actually. But just skim them to make sure all the transactions look like they're yours, and then don't look at the rate of return, and just set it to aside, but make sure that everything is okay. Um, common features of scams, and you guys might be looking at this and be like, oh my gosh, that's ridiculous, people really fall for this. The thing that I kind of was like, that cannot be true with marijuana stocks. <laughs> so what happens is investors and scam artists will kind of figure out what's going on in the news. Last year at this time, what was a huge disease sweeping over the world and everyone's going to die? Mm -hmm. Ebola. Mm -hmm. Well, we have this investment that's going to keep you or could cure you. I actually took it off because I thought it was so ridiculous, but I'm telling you about it now. Um, it was the Ebola scam. And they just there was a, a cure, and if you invested in it, you were going to make millions of dollars because it was going to save everybody. And people think, oh, that's really great. I'm helping people because there's going to be more money for this research. So just make sure you're doing your due diligence and checking things out. Um, marijuana stocks, when they legalized it in a couple of states, this was huge. Because these marijuana farms were going to grow exponentially and there was going to be thousands and millions of dollars available, so buy in to the pot stocks. And so <laughs> their penny stocks, which penny stocks are kind of junk stocks, are a lot more risky. But if you get into it, you're going to be on this cutting edge because medical marijuana is going to sweep across the country and everything's going to be happy. Um, they'll play off of global terrorism or world like wars and things like that. Um, and then they kind of do it this way. Through seminars, um, your free lunches, you go to Red Lobster and we're going to give you something. It might be an investment, it might be real estate, it could be a timeshare. Um, email and internet, and then direct mail, so you're doing those junk mail things. Um, word of mouth, well, Joyce did it, or Danny did it, oh, okay, I guess I will. Um, through telephones, text messages, and answering machines. If you ever receive a telephone call, and I wanted to touch on this, especially right now, tax season started today. Tax scams are huge. You're going to get emails and phone calls or voicemails saying that you have a problem with your taxes, that you didn't turn them in right, that you need to call immediately or the IRS is going to come and get you. They're going to knock on your door, you're going to have more fees, or you might be subject to an audit. The IRS, if they ever have an issue or a problem with you, probably going to be a very official looking letter. Um, they're probably going to contact you. Let's be honest, the IRS doesn't have a lot of time to make personal phone calls. It's going to be a letter they're going to expect you to respond. If you are afraid that you have been a victim of an IRS or somebody's calling you for a tax scam, call the IRS directly. If they've given you a piece of literature and you're like, I don't know if this is bogus, don't call the phone number that's on that piece of paper. Get onto irs.gov, look up the local phone number for your area, and they have a huge IRS place up in Ogden and then other places throughout the community that you can call and then go in person if you feel like you need to meet with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. So that's a huge scam, not so much investment, but related to money. What they'll do, I actually have a coworker. Um, she's very consumer savvy. She's been an educator for 30 plus years. Her and her husband started receiving phone calls this summer. And they went to her cell phone first. She didn't respond. They went to the home phone, and then she didn't respond there, but she was still a little bit scared. Like, how did they get all this information? And then the thing that, that caused them to respond is when they started calling her husband's cell phone because this is a work only number, he doesn't give it out to anyone but his work associates and his family. And they thought, how on earth, this must be real because the IRS has access to this information. So he called the number back and seemed a little bit kind of suspicious, and then he actually just went to the IRS directly. And they talked to him about, yeah, that's a scam, don't have to worry about it, your taxes are filed properly, everything is fine. 
So just be aware and cognizant of that as we're going into tax season. If you have any friends or family members that get scared, just give them the heads up as well. Um, the cost of fraud. In the United States alone, and that's where these numbers come from, over $50 billion a year is lost to fraud. That one family, I think their names were the Smarts in the, the Utah video, lost over $200,000. And they were about ready to lose their house because they had no way of covering the losses from the investment and then the home. So make sure that you, does anyone have $200,000 to lose? Does anyone have $5 that you really could afford to lose? Probably not. He sends you with your money. Danny's like, yeah, maybe. I'll take it if you want to give it away. Um, but there's also the emotional side effect um, to stress. They didn't touch on it in the video, but I suspect the smarts probably couldn't sleep at night. There was probably a lot of anxiety. They probably felt guilt. And they probably felt a little bit of like foolishness or stupidity. Like, how could we have fallen to this? And I'm so, ashamed. ashamed. Yes, ashamed is a huge one. And a lot of times, we might get taken advantage of, but because we feel ashamed, we're like, man, I made a really bad decision. I don't want to tell my friends. I don't want to tell my family member because they're going to think I'm not smart. But I think I'm a pretty smart person. And so shame and guilt are huge when it comes to investment fraud. This is kind of the hands-on stuff that I've been meaning to show you guys since we started these classes and have not gotten to. So I'm going to um, whip through the slides and then we're going to go to the live websites. And I'm going to walk you through it. If you go to the main site, what would it look like? So FINRA.org. Um, and I'm going to tell you the difference in these things right now. So FINRA is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. This is a private nonprofit that has been um, kind of taxed is the wrong word, but like commissioned by Congress to go in and regulate our financial securities markets. So they go in and they do investigations. If there's um, fraudulent activities going on, they're actually the ones that go in and strip the investment brokers and um, investment advisors of their licenses and restrict what they can do if they've done fraudulent activities. And their website is actually a lot of fun. I was playing on it this afternoon. Um, this is what the main site would look like if you get into the investor site, and I'll show you this. And then we'll walk you through the investor or the broker check. And on this um, site here, the finger brochure here talks to you about a helpline, a special helpline for seniors. And they're really concerned about investment fraud for seniors because a lot of times seniors get taken advantage of. They might be home all day alone, family members don't come to visit. Scam artists know that. So they call and they become friends and then they start booking them for millions of dollars. Um, in, the, in avoiding investing scams um, brochure, and then there's also the investor complaint program. So I'll show you a bunch of different places that you guys can go to and um, run through some questions with you as well. When you get into the broker check, You'll put in the broker's name. So here they've done, they actually did individual or firm. So if you're kind of wanting to find out, is this firm legitimate? Is this investment broker legitimate? You can actually check them both. Um, somebody might be a legitimate investment advisor, but perhaps a firm they're working with, or at the free seminar they're saying, this is our company, might not be. So check both of them that way. But you'll get to go in and you'll get to see, um, are they registered? And we'll tell you um, yes or no there. The disclosures, if there's ever a disclosure, this means there's a problem. Um, I recall as a child, my, one of my dad's friends was an investment advisor. He called the house incessantly. My dad always hated it because he was always trying to get him to invest in these kind of sketchy things. We'll come to find out that broker, that advisor, had his license stripped back in 2007 for fraudulent activity and selling um, people's investments without their authorization. And I remember briefly my dad saying something. He's like, oh man, I'm so glad I got out of that relatively unscathed. My dad did lose a little bit of money, but I actually put that in broker's name in today, and sure enough, he popped up. Um, and then Did it show that, that there was a disclosure, or does it explain what? It'll occurred? explain what the disclosure, so it'll show the disclosure, mm -hmm. and then you can scroll down, and it will tell you what that disclosure was, and kind of the status of the investigation. And I'll show you that. Um, and then there's 46 years in the securities mm -hmm. industry, and it tells you what exams they've passed. Beware that even though they might have disclosures against them and are no longer licensed, it's still going to show that they've passed those exams at one point in their life. So they might say, well, I'm registered to do this. What they're not telling you is probably the license has been stripped, and they did pass the test, which is legitimate, but it's just they lost it at one point in their life. Um, go on. Understanding designations. You said that the prospectus is incredibly difficult to read, and I agree. You might walk into a free luncheon and they say, Dean Johnson, LLC, CEO, 
XPA with like 10,000 like acronyms after your name. And so you can get on to the FINRA website and select a designation, and then it will tell you, is it a legitimate designation? Or did they just make up, oh, guess what? CCOS is actually really something. It's a certified compliance specialist. So you can see what all of those acronyms mean. And you might just say, if somebody's offering you something, and they say, oh, I'm licensed, look at all these, say, can I get a business card? I'm going to go do some research, and I'll get back with you. Um, you can always, and don't ever feel bad about asking, what tests have you passed and are you certified? You're going to want to make sure that they're certified with FINRA, which is here, and then with the SEC and registered to um, practice in your state. Because somebody might have passed a test, but they may be only registered to practice in California. So make sure that they're registered in your state. So there's three places they have to be registered with. Um, they'll tell you on the designations, and we'll get onto this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But then um, there's the SEC, and so this is their big. Um, phone number are kind of a key for them. In addition to FINRA, the SEC is the Securities and Exchange Commission, and this is a government entity or a government agency. Their website, they have um, sec.gov, and then investor.gov is the main one you want to go to if you're having problems and you need to file complaints and things like that. The SEC will partner with um, FINRA, so you might get on FINRA's website and do their broker check because the site is phenomenal, then you might go on to sec.gov and check there. A lot of times the FINRA and the SEC database will feed each other information. So if FINRA's conducted an investigation because they received a complaint, they're a lot of times going to talk to SEC so that they have that information as well. You might on a rare occasion find that SEC has some information that FINRA doesn't, but for the most part the FINRA database is pulling from the SEC and you might want um, and then this one, and I told you about this brochure, this one is critical. If you have aging parents or even neighbors that you worry about, um, get them this phone number. It may be they felt like they've been taken advantage of and they don't want to tell you about it because you might get mad at them. Um, I still feel guilty about it to this day, but when my grandpa was in the early stages of dementia, he was at home all by himself, two agencies went in. One of them sold him a security system. And he was feeling really scared, and I was like, how can you be scared? You're a man, you've done all these things in your life. But he was frightened to be by himself, and the family kind of got after him. Well, we should have sat back and thought, you know what, maybe we should have done that for him to begin with. And then um, he bought a prepaid funeral plan, which he really didn't need, because he already had a life insurance policy that would have covered that. But they kind of took advantage of it, and we played on how helpful it would be for the family. So while those aren't like common investment frauds that you think of, just give that line to them. And the seniors that you know can call this line at any time. It's kind of like judgment-free zone because it's on the phone and these people don't really know them. So if they're scared and don't want to tell you about it, you might just have them that line and say, hey, we, are, we just went to this presentation and we're worried about you. Make sure you call and follow up that way. Um, the Utah Division of Securities. So we have FINRA, SEC, and then the Utah Division of Securities. And the one gentleman on the Affinity video, he's the one that said, well, you wouldn't go to a church member to plot your appendix while I was listening to them about investing. He's kind of over, or at the time was over the SEC. And the state um, SEC, this is their website here, but they actually will go out and conduct investigations. One of my friends works here, and they get complaints, and then they go out and do research and conduct information, and a lot of times that their information that they gather is critical for the prosecution to take those people down. Um, but check that way. And then we're going to go on to saveandinvest.org as well. Saveandinvest.org is kind of um, the communication or community education site that FINRA's put together. It's just like a lot more fun and colorful than FINRA's like regular site. So if you like something that's not as like daunting or like dry, then saveandinvest.org is a really great site. And they'll, they'll fly in and work all together. And then these are the questions I've been talking to you about for two weeks. And so we'll get to these and I'll show you the live sites and if you guys have questions we can touch on them. But ask questions to your investment advisor. And this is not only the fraudulent investment advisors, but the ones that you want to do business with. Um, I always say the rule of three. If you're going to find somebody that you want to do business with, check out at least three people and kind of see how you feel. Make a decision. If you feel good about it, then proceed. If you've gone to someone, you're talking to them and things just don't seem right, even though your friend really had high praises for them, don't be afraid to walk out and go find somebody else. There is nothing wrong with shopping around. It's your money and you work too hard to lose it. So these are questions you're going to want to ask. Um, I looked up an ABV form on Finder today for an investor. It's really 
like dry kind of like a prospectus, but it just tells you are they registered, what can they sell, and so you can ask them, can you send me a copy of this ABU form? And if they say no, I don't really have one, I'd probably be hesitant because they should have those registered. Um, have you ever been disciplined or have you ever been convicted of fraud? What are you licensed to sell? What's your policy on commission? What's your policy on fees? How do you make your money is a critical one. Um, I've said it before, you might find an investment advisor that gets paid on commission, and they might be really great. But if you're deciding between somebody paid on commission and somebody that's fee only, I would hesitate to choose a commission-based broker just because they're getting paid to sell your stuff. So you might have a really great investment and want to sit and hold it for a little bit, but they want to sell, 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 sell because they're going to make more money. So if someone's fee only, typically you can call them as many times as you want for a one-time fee that you'll pay annually or quarterly, and then you can take advantage of it and, and decide how your investments are going to be handled. But you know if I decide to sell, they're really not, I mean, they want you to do well, but like there's no pain on their part if you do sell it or if you do it. What are the risks? We talked about how there's always risks. Can I get a copy of the investment prospectus, the broker's account, or the fund summary? They should be able to provide you that information. Keeping in mind, our friend from, was he from Alabama or Georgia? I can't remember, the investment Jordan. Jordan. He actually asked them for a prospectus and fund overviews, and they gave him fraudulent documents. So it's not just enough to ask for a prospectus, but you're going to want to get on and make sure they're registered with FINRA and the SEC. Um, and then what do you have to do for the fund to gain 12%? Val Southwick kept promising 12% returns. He kept sending money. And at, at a time, he might have been able to show 12% returns because what he'll do is he'll go in and he'll catch the smarts over here and then he'll get the Johnsons over here. And when the smarts money has been spent, he'll go get the Johnsons money and use that as the return on investment for the smarts so they can show money going into the account. And that's kind of how their, their pyramids or their Ponzi schemes work. Is they'll get people on the bottom line and then their money's gone, they'll go get more people and transfer those funds and that money around. Um, and then, um, is the investment consistent with my investment goals? If, when you go to the seminars, do they ask you what your investment goals are? That's one of the very first thing. Okay. You want to know if you're conservative or want some equity, you want to go risk or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're correct. Yeah. So they're going to ask you, well, what are your goals? Because if you're savvy, you're going to be thinking, does this match up with my goals? I want to retire in three years, or I need to pay for my child's education, or we really want to buy a second home in Arizona or St. George where it's warm because we hate winters. And so they're going to ask you what those goals are. And then they're going to tie that back into there and try and make that connection. The personal connection, oh, this is going to help you get this. Or this is going to help you do this. Um, when you go in and I say they should ask you your goals, but be cautious in the way in which they do that. Um, do they really sincerely care? Are they going to sit down and look at your investments, your taxes? Are they going to spend time with you? If it's fee only, absolutely. They should want to do that. If they don't, maybe walk away and, and get your, your handbag and your running shoes. Um, something else that's really critical is if you have a retirement program through work, depending on how your company is set up, a lot of times your human resource officials don't feel comfortable talking about investments because that's not what they were trained in. But they should have investment advisors who work for the fund, company that they use, that you can contact and have them sit down with you. You can schedule a quarterly appointment or an annual appointment and review things and see exactly where you're at. Usually those investment advisors are paid salary. They're there to help you. They're not going to try to convince you to sell items because it's not commission based. So if your work has something like that and you don't feel comfortable going out and finding your own investment advisor, I would encourage you to take advantage of it. Um, just because you can ask them all the questions you need to, a lot of times it's over the phone at any time, but then you can make a face-to-face -face appointment because they'll travel out to where you're at. Um, discretionary authority, this is critical. So if you give somebody a broker discretionary authority, you essentially just give them free reign to do whatever they want with your money. I'd be very, very cautious about doing that because they don't have to contact you before they sell an investment. Brokers, by the nature of the trade and laws that regulate them, anytime you want to make a sale, they're supposed to contact you by phone. And that's something you can ask, I mean, ask an investment advisor is how are you going to get in touch with me when you want to do something or when you have a piece of advice? Oh, I'll send you an email. Or, oh, I don't know. Phone calls are typically best because you've got a voicemail, you can respond when it's most convenient for you. 
I have an email account, we could still have lots of stuff. And I miss a lot of things just because everybody in my golf stores are sending me stuff. So make sure that you are cautious with who you give the di discretionary authority to. And then I can't tell you enough, but make sure they're registered for state security, FINRA, and the SEC. And we'll run through um, some of these live websites really quick. What questions do you guys have right now? Okay, I'm gonna run through some of these live websites. So this is investor.gov. So this is the website that the Security and Exchange Commission has put through. They actually just put on this tag um, that says check out your investment professional. So you can go in here, click, and you can search the database. And then I'll click on that in just one moment, but I also want to make you aware of this other spot that I've highlighted here in blue. It's researching and managing your investments. So investing on your own, what to do. If I'm working with brokers and investment advisors, what should I expect or be looking for? And then um, if you have questions, tips, and complaints. So if we click on search the database, this is going to say, do you want to search individual or do you want to search a firm? What do you guys want to do? Here. We'll do individual. And then you can type in the individual's name here. Does anybody have an investment advisor they want to check out? If you don't want to say anything. Oh, sorry. try Dan Luke. Dan Luke? Yeah. L U K. -E. Probably Daniel, yeah. Where did you go? Uh, up. Does it give you the company on there? Um, let's oh, see. No, no. Yeah. Keeping in mind we're not advocating you use these people. Um, Daniel James Luke, he's got a number there, and then it says that he's with DFPG Investments, and the Office of Employment is located in the state of Utah. Does that sound familiar? He works for a company called Diversify. I just met him for the first time last week. Okay. So you can go in here, it looks like he has registered. Um, Diversify Wealth Management in South Jordan. Mm -hmm. It tells you his registration dates were um, from 2013 to 2015, 2011 to 2014, kind of depending on the company he's worked for. Um, disclosure information and broker dealer information is there. If you're like, you can only remember one website, and I go investor.com, I'm gonna go check in and see. Usually the SEC and FINRA will tie into each other, and you can see that right down here where the arrow is, um, which right there, you can click on that and go into FINRA's broker check. So we could do that that way and type it in and see. This is perfect. When you go into FINRA, they have terms and conditions. Um, I pulled it up today. You can decide if you want to accept it or decline it. We're just going to accept it for this purpose. You can see here that um, Mr. Luke is a broker investment advisor. He doesn't have any disclosures against him, so no complaints have ever been reported against this gentleman. He has 14 years in the securities industry. He's passed five exams, and he's registered with 37 U.S. states and territories. Um, and then you can go down here. If he were to have a disclosure event, you'd scroll down, and this is where it would be shown. Just in the disclosure event, it would tell you the year um, and what it was. And then his current registrations, previous registrations, and it's told you the past exams that he's um, done. And he's registered in these 37 states, and he's regu uh, registered with FINRA. If he had disclosures against him, you could download the full PDF report. It gives you a full review of what the disclosure and the problem were. Um, it tells you what the action was. Was the securities license strict? did they have to pay fines? So if we just download that full report down at the bottom of that red button, that's where you would find that information. Um, so if the if their um, license is stripped, can they even get it back? And if they would, would that then be a disclosure that would sort of like be a blue disclosure as opposed to a red disclosure? If the license was lost or stripped, it would be notated on there. Um, I was trying to do some research on it and I haven't been able to find a straight answer yet. I think sometimes they can get their securities licenses back, sometimes they can't. Just because they don't get their securities licenses back doesn't mean they still don't practice in the industry. So just be aware of that. Um, the gentleman that I had referred to with my father, um, he had his license stripped in 2007. He's still working for an investment firm. I'm not sure exactly in what capacity. I don't think he can sell and advise directly like he used to. 
But he actually, the reason he lost his license wasn't for the shady things he did. It's because he was unwilling to disclose his actions. So FINRA assumed that as reason for guilt because you're not going to provide the information, you're hiding something, and that's when they stripped his license. So I thought that was really interesting. I'm like, ooh, I'm going to find some juicy information. Don't worry, he just didn't <laughs> provide the information, that's the juicy information. So. How does that work with a large firm like Wells Fargo where they have personal bankers and they have uh, wealth uh, advisors, that kind of thing? Are they, uh, in fact, I asked one here just two weeks ago, I said, yeah. what are all your credentials? Oh, I got all this, you know, because we're all this stuff. But is he going to be listed on here, or is it Wells Fargo have him under some umbrella that's different? Check and see, because on FINRA you can search firm, but you can also check the individual. And if he's passed all of those things that he said he's passed or she has passed, mm -hmm. they should be on FINRA. And then it should show on there, oh, Dean Smith is working at Wells Fargo, maybe he was previously at United Financial Services, and then he's transitioned to Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to find him on here. One thing I didn't find on here, and maybe I just searched improperly, mm -hmm. I just wanted to see like, oh, is E-Trade or Scott Trade on there? And those aren't on here, but their broker should be if you had a broker in particular you were thinking about. Um, and then we'll do saveandinvest.org. Um, Love this site. So they have special information for military families here, educating youth, tools, and resources. And then this is the fun one, um, protect your money. So tools and resources kind of has a conglomeration of all four of the buttons. They just throw it all in there for you. But there's this cool thing that spot and avoid fraud and then ask and check. So you can get in here and this kind of ties into the thinner broker check but they actually give you a little bit more um, advice about what specific questions should you ask. And the featured resource is choosing an actual investment professional. So we've kind of given you little tidbits and pieces you can click on that and it says, where do I start? Do I want a financial planner? Do I want a financial advisor? Do I want an insurance agent? Do I want an accountant or a lawyer helping me with all of this? <laughs> yeah. So saveandinvest.org is like the like pretty like FINRA site. It's just like it's the investor education. The investor education. education. So save and invest is usually yellow and then FINRA is the white and then the calling blue are kind of their colors. So they tie in together. Um, I missed her question, but was that was it about insurance agents? Um, her question was, because I clicked on this from saveandinvest.org site and then it took me into FINRA and she said, but it just took you into FINRA. Oh. And so I just said it's because Save and Invest is their investor education. So it's high. Are insurance agents listed under these uh, same criteria as uh, brokers? You may find um, an insurance agent on the FINRA website. But insurance agents themselves have different regulatory authorities and agencies over them. So if they're not actually giving or selling like stocks or investments, they might not be on the FINRA website. Could you go back to the I want to see what takes you. What to insurance, agent? insurance agents? Absolutely. So we're going to click. We turned in here. It says, where do we start? This is what we're going to pull up when we click on insurance agents. So it tells you um, what are they, who regulates them. Um, this kind of maybe answers your question. It's the National Association of Insurance Commissioners that regulates insurance agents, and then what do they offer? And then there's some helpful sites down here, like tips on working with a professional, and you can click on the National Insurance. So on that website, can you look up if your insurance agent is good, like, like the other things we were going to look up? Mm -hmm. So if, and I, let's... I don't know the answer to your question. I'll be very forthright with you. Because insurance agents don't always sell securities accounts or they're not brokers, okay. they probably are not always going to be on the FINRA website because FINRA oh, does okay. brokerage and security yeah, accounts. Do, but. but insurance agents are regulated. It's called, it looks like the National Association of Insurance Commissioners here. So there's probably some kind of agency and maybe we can click on their website and there might be a way to check and see are they verified. Now FINRA, anytime you go to leave their website, is going to say, you're leaving our website, we're no longer responsible, are you okay with that? And I just said yes. Because it brings up the question, since we're on FINRA website, why does it have the insurance agent? Should we be worried about them? 
Um, if you're on FINRA and you're doing a broker check and you pull up your insurance agent because you want to see, because your insurance agent could be licensed to sell securities, I would be concerned if there's disclosures or negative items there. If not, and they just sell securities insurance, then it's up to you to decide. Are you comfortable with that? I have never looked at this website. I don't even know where to begin searching, but you could check on there and see if there's some information available about verifying. Another thing you guys can do um, is Google search it and Better Business Bureau. And Google searches with names phenomenal now because especially when people get riled up enough, if you have a really good experience, how many people do you tell on average? Maybe one to two. They've done consumer and market research. If you have a horrible experience at a restaurant, at a hair salon, with an investment advisor, how many people are you likely to tell? Ten. At least ten. <laughs> at least ten. So everyone knows about Sean's horrible experiences, and they think she's negative Nelly because she's always laughing about how horrible everyone is. But most days, I might have really good experiences as a consumer. I just don't tell people. This is not interesting. No one wants to hear about the nice lady that checked me out and like complimented my sweater, but we're more likely to want to know about that horrible person that smashed the shopping cart into my car when they were bagging my groceries and did all this fraud and stuff. So yeah, on average, people tell 10 people, but good experience is very, very minimal. So that's why the internet is so great, because you can go on, type in a name, and you can find experiences. You can do that for doctors, you can do it for hospitals, you can do it for investment advisors, pretty much anything you can get consumer business on. So, not saying they're always accurate, but it's a there's, Is there some place that they're great that would say, hey, this person's very successful on this one? Like a website or? Yeah, some place where you can rate these people. That's, well, the bottom line is they're all, they're all going to tell you they're going to get some money. Mm -hmm. Some of them are much more successful than others. Yes. Um, <clears throat> you can check like their, if they're fund managers, like over a, a particular mutual fund, you can check their history that way and, and compare it to other people and other brokerage firms. But then you're really they're looking at their top management. You're not looking at the right. individual brokerage. Um, I would do Google searches and then I would go, like FINRA is going to tell you if they've had problems or like broken laws. They're not going to tell you how successful they've been. But if you can get the names of some people that have used them for several years, granted they're not always going to give you that information, but if you're like in the waiting room, to go in and meet with the advisor, you might say, hey, are you happy with the service you received here? I'm just shopping around. If you feel comfortable, tell me a little bit about the experience. There's also other websites out there. Yes. Um, Yelp is one where yes. the community will rate people and professions and different things. And so you'll see their Yelp rating, and they usually will not only put the number of stars, but they'll put how you know this, how this person affected them, or what horrible thing they did, or whatever. It's it's similar to your Amazon reviews. Well, isn't there? <coughs> there can you see there to get mostly negative? I mean, a lot of people. A lot of people do positive too. Successes. Yeah, a lot of people do positive things on Yelp as well. And there, oh, okay. there's other resources too. Um, just doing the Google search, making sure that you put quotes around their name so that you get George Smith as opposed to everybody named George and everyone named Smith. You know, that will help narrow your field. Excellent. Doing the research tips as our expert. Just remember that not every George Smith is the George Smith you're looking for. Yeah. And just, you know, look at what you're doing and evaluate the websites as you go. So if it's something that, that looks really cheesy or like a, you know, switch, switch or a clickbait, type of site, don't trust that one as much as you would, something that is like FINRA that you can definitely see as a name that you're familiar with, that sort of thing. There's um, also phone numbers, kind of depending on what you're looking for on the FINRA website. So if you're just frustrated looking digitally and actually want to talk to a human, you can call the phone numbers and say, hey, I'm trying to do some research, I'm tired of looking online, can you just help me? And they have people on staff that can kind of walk you through the process and answer any questions you have. Because you might download and see the disclosure on there, and you're like, I don't get it. What does this mean? You can call them, and they can explain that as well. To learn more or to find a class, visit slcolibrary.org/smartinvesting.